pleasure to have an opportunity to worship with you here at Biola. I'm really excited about today. Had an opportunity to sit down with your president, President Barry Gorey, and he and I had dinner, uh, no, lunch about a year ago, and we look forward to hooking back in together. And then I just saw Dr. Doretha O'Quinn uh, show up. I, 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 where is she? I, there she is in the back. Let's give God praise for her. Amen. And then Dr. Glenn Kenoshita, he is just a miracle worker, and I thank him for receiving us. Come on, give God praise for him and Tamara. And then my good friend joined me. He was formerly here at Biola, but now we stole him, and, and he now works at USC. Um, but he's a, a tall drop of water who loves the Lord thy God. I'm just thankful that he's here. It's good to have your A-team with you. Let's praise God for Dr. Richard Flory. All right, now, you've practiced. In the black church, if you don't make some noise, do some clapping, every once in a while do some amens, we can be here for three hours. Y'all feel it, brother? Okay, now let me hear you say amen. Let me hear you say praise the Lord. Now, if I say, let's give God praise, put your hands together and give God praise. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm starting to feel you a little bit. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Dear God, we would ask that you would empower this, your servant. Uh, give him a word. Allow, allow his presence, allow my presence to be reduced behind the cross of Jesus so that we may hear a word from God. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. The Bible says in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This month we celebrate Black History Month, and so the presentation today will deal with the history of the AME Church and then challenge our thinking in this postmodernic age. Is the black church a necessity? Is it a necessary institution in a post-racial America? Is the black church relevant, necessary, in a post-racial America? In 1787, the black church is the place of freedom for an enslaved black people. This month marks the anniversary of the founding of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AKA the AME Church. Slavery, racism, racial oppression, lynching, religious tension, and governmental oligarchies are the context for blacks living in America in 1787. The AME Church, grew out of the Free African Society, which Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, and other founders boldly believed Africans could learn to read, write, and live as free people. It was in 1787 at St. George's Methodist, St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church when officials pulled blacks literally from their knees while they were praying because the slave clothes would not allow them to pray in the same place at the same time with whites. The Free African Society members discovered just how far American Methodists would go to enforce racial discrimination against African Americans. Hence, these members of St. George's made plans to transform their mutual aid society into a black church. Although most wanted to affiliate with the Protestant Episcopal Church, Richard Allen led a small group of black people who resolved to remain Methodist 
1794, Bethel AME Church was dedicated with Richard Allen as its pastor. Bethel AME Church becomes the first of now some 7,000 AME churches to establish Bethel's independence from interfering white Methodists. Richard Allen, a former Delaware slave, successfully sued in the Pennsylvania courts in 1807 and in 1815 for the right of his black church to exist as an independent institution because not only did they sue Richard Allen and his church, but they broke in and stole the Bibles and the books for which he was, from which he was teaching. Because black Methodists in, the, in other middle Atlanta communities encountered racism and desired Richard religious autonomy, Allen called them to meet in Philadelphia to form a new Wesleyan denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The first black Methodist church, thus the first black denomination was born on this soil in the year 1816. And now we have some 2.5 million members, some 7,000 churches. We own some seven colleges. Come on, let's give God praise for progress. But let us progress to the year 2010. Princeton professor Eddie Glaude authored the article, The Black Church is Dead, openly critiques the relevancy of the black church in a post-racial context. He criticizes the polity, the absence of the prophetic voice, prosperity-minded preachers, and the black church's failure to meet the needs within the black community. Why do we need a black church? Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, and others are speaking the truth to power then why do we need the black church? Today I want to preach on the subject, press on. Somebody say press on. The, the content and the context of this, you all are doing so well. The content and the context of the biblical text compels us to press on. Paul, the spiritual coach, is pressing us to stay real relevant and responsible for the least of these. He's pressing them the Philippians, to avoid the Judaizers who dared to send them backwards. The Mosaic covenant was fine, but now Jesus has given us a new covenant. We ought to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, thy mind, and their soul, and we ought to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Why must you go backwards? He has given us a new thought. Paul is teaching us to accept new thoughts, new methods of discipleship, new ways to meet the needs of a dying world. Perhaps that's the challenge with the church. Are we still stuck in a place that God never intended for us to stay? Or does he want us to progress in this post-modernic age? I'd like to run three races. Somebody say press out. Press through. A little louder. Press on. Y'all doing real well. Press out. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, not that I have already obtained all of this, have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul presses out being satisfied with his spiritual attainments and tranquilized by his past triumphs. Paul pressed out satisfaction. Indeed, he says, we are running the race to win, so we must not look backwards, but we must look forward. Yet, Paul had every reason to be satisfied. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Paul had every reason to feel satisfied. Paul had been saved for 30 years before the first gospel was written. Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament without physically meeting the primary source. Paul was blinded, beaten, barred, shipwrecked, shackled, ripped up, and run out of town for righteousness. I don't know about you, but it would be hard for me to pastor like Paul pastored. But Paul, who had every reason to feel satisfied, Paul pressed out self-satisfaction to change the context of the kingdom of God. Yet yeah, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, are, have already been made perfect. The word perfect in this context implies the process of becoming a mature Christian. 
Christianity is over 2,000 years old, but we have not matured very much. We got a lot of old Christians, but they're still very immature. I've always wondered about those who work out on a regular basis, particularly the new people who want to work out. I'm always amazed with immature athletes. You find them in the gym and they're dressed in their designer outfits, wearing designer shoes and wearing full makeup. And it seems to me that they're a bit more concerned with messing up their hair than getting in shape. Perhaps they're satisfied with keeping the status quo. They look good on the outside, but do they have the desire to change on the inside? And perhaps that's the challenge that we're faced with today. The church has become too satisfied. We are satisfied using antiquity language and a postmodernity reality. Perhaps the problem with the church is we're too satisfied with past accomplishments. We're satisfied teaching Aristotle the unmoved mover God. We are satisfied holding on to Descartes' modern philosophy, creating a doubt to determine certainty. Much like the church of Sardis, a Roman church would have be, had a famous reputation for being alive, but the church was dead. The church of Sardis lived on his past reputation. They rested on their laurels instead of saving souls for Christ. The Pew study reveals mainline churches are emptying and grain and dying. The average age is 55 to 65 years of old, years of age. Mainline churches have become museums showing, showcasing past accomplishment. Show me a church that has become satisfied, and I will show you a church with empty pews, empty Bible study, empty prayer meetings, empty offering plates, empty discipleship training, empty prophetic voice, and empty praise. But show me a church it's that should not, a church should not be satisfied until every soul is saved. A church should not be satisfied until communities are served. A church should not be satisfied until families are saved, until gang members are saved, until racists are saved, until drug addicts are saved, until the lost are saved, until agnostics and atheists are saved. If souls are not saved, nothing is saved. Dr. Martin Luther King said, we will not be satisfied when poor people move from a smaller ghetto to a larger ghetto. No, we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Come on, let's give God praise. It's not enough to be satisfied to be in the race, but we have to get in the race to win. We have to press out satisfaction to take hold of that which Christ took hold of us. Somebody say press through. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Paul says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. In other words, we don't run the race looking behind, but we run the race looking ahead. God did not give us eyes in the back of our head, but God gave us eyes in the front of it. The first step to winning the race is to focus on the race we're in. Amen? The problem with the church is we're focused on everything but the race. We're socializing, dining, texting, tweeting. I saw somebody just a minute ago tweeting. LinkedIn, Facebooking, but we fail to focus on transforming the lives of the least of these. Jesus says, what you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. How often do we pass by and fail to look at that person and we decide that it's somebody else's responsibility, Levite, that's somebody else's responsibility, priest, but the Samaritan stops and helps the least of these. Paul said, but one thing I do, the one thing is paying attention to God. If you put God first, everything else follows. The secret to serving God is to focus on the one thing. The truth is every great biblical leader failed but got back in the race to succeed when he or she focused on one thing. Joseph had a failed dysfunctional family but focused on leadership to become the second in command of Egypt. David had a failed marriage but focused on leadership to become the best of all of Israel's kings. Samson failed at self-discipline, but focused on stewardship to serve humanity. Peter failed Jesus three times, but focused on discipleship to love God's people because Jesus says, if you love me, do you please feed my sheep? Oh, boy. 
We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, yes? But we must get back in the race, yes? If we must focus on something, perhaps we can choose one of these things to focus on. Let us focus on feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, housing the homeless. But not only that, let us focus on racial reconciliation. I don't believe God made a black church or a brown church or an Asian church or a white church because heaven is fully integrated. God is looking for us to make sure that we make souls saved. And the only way that we are able to make souls saved, help souls to be saved, is first reconcile that the God in us saw enough in us to bring us into the light out of the darkness. And if we can do the same thing for somebody else, the world would be a better place to be. Come on, give God praise. Let us focus on integrating the house of worship on Sunday morning. Let us focus on serving God's people, not marketing religious doctrine. Let us focus on ending homophobia, xenophobia, and oscillating values, dividing conservative fundamental Christians from liberal process theologians. Let us focus on loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, and thy soul, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Let us focus on running the race to win because we're on the same team serving the same God. And if Jesus is able to be pulled from the grave, then we can be pulled out of our mindset that holds us back. Ah, somebody say press on and I'm coming to an end. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I like this ending part. Now, normally in the black sermon, this is where you're supposed to get up and shout at the end. I'm teaching you as I'm preaching to you. The Bible doesn't say preach. It says go teach. Do you get the lesson? Amen. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Every runner, every athlete take, needs a coach to tell them to press on to win the race. The coach knows our full potential. The coach has an encouraging word. We all need a coach. Joshua needed Moses. Elisha needed Elijah. Tim needed Paul. I needed a man by the name of Reverend Cecil Murray. In every race, a runner knows there is a point where the runner will hit the wall, yes? Here at Biola, have you ever felt like giving up, giving out, throwing in the towel? Am I talking to anybody here today? You felt like giving up the race because not only was your back up against the wall, but you had, you had hit that wall. The truth is, even Jesus hit the wall, but Jesus had help. They beat him, made him carry a 200-pound wooden cross. They nailed him. They pierced his side, and just before he died, he said it was finished. The truth is, it really wasn't finished. Because we know that he died, but he went into that grave, and he went into the depths of hell, and the Holy Spirit took a hold of Jesus and pressed him to come out of that grave. Because he died, we live. But if he had just simply died, then there would be no different than Jesus and the minor and the major prophets. There would be no difference in Jesus and Muhammad. There would be no difference. But the truth is, if Jesus died, crucified, but was resurrected, that is the reason that we preach. That is the reason that we celebrate. Jesus finished the race. And the world has become a better place. The world thought he was dead, but he was yet alive. Ah, what's about that question, Reverend, that you started off with? What do we do in a post-racial America? Well, the truth is we have much to do. We have a black president, but there are one million black men in prison. We have a Latino mayor, but we have, we have, we have some 40% of our Latino brothers and sisters moving through the criminal justice system. And we still have a black on brown issue in this country. We have Jeremy Lin, the first Asian basketball player. Praise God, I like me watching me some Jerry Lin. But Asian, hallelujah. But Asians are still discriminated against on a daily basis. Just ask your Asian brothers and sisters. They won't tell you, but they're discriminated against on a daily basis. We have to finish the race. Somebody said the black church is dead. Well, the black church is not dead if injustice lives. Martin Luther King said if there's injustice anywhere, it's a 
threat to justice everywhere. If the black church is dead, injustice is dead. If the black church is dead, racism is dead. If the black church is dead, poverty is dead. If the black church is dead, discrimination is dead. If the black church is dead, then the AME church is dead. If the black church is dead, the church of God in Christ is dead. If the black church is dead, the progressive Baptists are dead. If the black church is dead, then God is dead. If the black church is dead, then the Bible is dead. If the black church is dead, then everybody in this room is dead. And I declare and I decree, but the black church is yet alive, treating us on a daily basis. Is there anybody in the house that said that God gave you life and he gave it to you more abundantly? If you're happy and you want to do more than just sit back on your rusty, dusty, and wait for somebody else to do something, but get up and do something for the Lord, then I dare you in the name of Jesus to give God the glory by giving God the praise. I believe I'm talking to somebody in the house today. If you're ready to change the world, if you're ready to hold on to the Word of God, give God a standing ovation because if it had not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? Come on, let's give him another hand clap of praise. Come on, let's give him another hand clap of praise. Come on, let's give him another hand clap of praise. You're alive. You're alive. You're alive. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.